David Wilson. I am president of the Wall Walla Valley Chamber of Commerce, and it's absolutely my great pleasure to introduce you uh, to our fifth annual business summit. And uh, I, we have a fabulous day planned ahead, and so hopefully you can stick through all the sessions. Um, this has uh, been something that we uh, we started five years ago. We have a couple of returning champions to the day, including our first speaker. And uh, you, you will, uh, uh, I think you'll get a lot out of all the sessions. So how this sort of works is we're going to be in this room for two keynotes. Um, we'll take a really short break between the speakers, so we'll try to keep on time. So um, after, uh, after Lou, we'll take a quick five-minute refresh coffee. Um, you know, you can go check your digital cigarette and make sure nothing really, really important hasn't happened. Um, <laughs> And then if you wouldn't mind, set to stun or go to the dark side of the moon and shut it off, uh, which is really, really edgy. Um, and then we'll come back here for another uh, uh, keynote speaker um, that will be very fun. And then um, we will uh, take a, another break and then we will have two sets of breakouts uh, at from 11 to noon. So we'll get out of this room so they can set it for lunch. And there is, um, Casey, is this the Lewis or the Clark? I keep calling them both. Okay, you know, I'm a big uh, Lewis and Clark fan, so we are in the Sacagawea room. That is the Lewis room. Um, and so the breakout sessions are gonna be in the Lewis and then up the stairs in the Renaissance. So if you should have a program in that that'll identify which sessions are where and what you're most interested in. You, you're welcome to, uh, you know, uh, go to either one or sp split, go to both. Um, then that will go from 11 to noon, plus or minus, and then we will come back in here starting at 12.15 uh, for a luncheon, uh, and then um, we'll hear from uh, Joe Sprague with Alaska Airlines. Do our luncheon um, that will go till about 11, um, till, sorry, till about 1.45, uh, and then we will have two sets of afternoon panels. So when we finish luncheon here, we'll be done in here, and then <clears throat> again, you'll see in your uh, panels uh, will take place back in those same rooms, um, beginning uh, 145 to 245, and then from 3 to 4. Um, and then uh, from 4 o'clock out in the foyer uh, will be a, a wine reception um, that is uh, sponsored by Walla Walla Valley Honda. And uh, we're really pleased that uh, um, uh, Goose Ridge is pouring and Reiniger is here. Chuck is here, the actual winemaker. So Chuck, thank you. Um, and we also have uh, Castillo de Feliciana and uh, uh, Sam uh, Castillo is here. And so again, thanks for supporting us on that. Thank you. Um, so uh, we have a full day. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, you know, this is a pretty broad, eclectic group of people, and so we purposely have made the program pretty eclectic as far as uh, the session so that everybody kind of gets something out of this. And um, I, think, I think we have accomplished it again this year. The one thing they didn't mention to me was just what a handsome group of people have signed up for our summit this year. And so I want to just compliment you. Uh, looking good. Um, so. Um, the other, uh, so there's a few things that I, a few folks that I need to thank, uh, really we pull this together, um, really with the help of a lot of, uh, sponsors and to make this thing happen. So, uh, the first person and, and a company I want to acknowledge is CH2M Hill that sponsored our morning coffee and breakfast, the most important meal of the day. And uh, Willie Bashirs is a good friend of ours. So Willie, thank you for, uh, you know, getting folks going this morning. Um, and our uh, presenting sponsors uh, are uh, first is Pacific uh, Power, and Bill Clemens is a longtime friend of the chamber and sits on our board. So, Bill, thank you, and we'll be hearing more from Bill in a minute. Um, the Port of Walla Walla uh, has been uh, f with us from the beginning, so we appreciate the port support for the summit. Uh, the city of Walla Walla, um, and I think they're going to be coming in a little bit later, but again, the city of Walla Walla has been a great supporter. City of College Place, um, along uh, with the port. Walla Walla County has also been a supporter of this event and helped uh, with marketing funds. Um, our supporting sponsors that have been with us as well have been Abadan, which helps us with all the signage, and we really appreciate that. They will have a booth out front. Inland Cellular will have a booth out front. They've been with us as well and a key partner. They have a bunch of goodies, so stop by, put in your card, and I think they're going to pull the winner at the uh, uh, cocktail reception. So um, Express Employment Pro uh, Professionals and uh, Shannon Bergevin is here. So thank you, Shannon, for helping us out. 
and as I mentioned, Walla Walla Valley Honda sponsored our uh, our uh, reception, our biggest breakout session at the end of the day. So uh, if we could just give a round of applause to all our sponsors make today happen. I appreciate it. Um, and stop by the vendors out uh, during the breaks, um, and uh, Pacific Power also is exhibiting there, and they have some very cool programs, so you should check, uh, check them out. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our title sponsor from the very beginning has been Community Bank, and they have been a very key partner of the Chamber on a lot of initiatives, but especially the summit, and without them, um, it wouldn't happen. And so what I'd like to do is introduce the President and CEO of Community Bank, Tom Moran, and Tom, join us on stage if you would. Tom Moran. Thank you. Thanks. First, just kind of show of hands. Who's uh, traveling in from out of town for this thing? Oh, pretty good. Pretty good. Uh, pretty good out of town presence here. So, uh, for the folks out of town, depending on where you're coming from, uh, a couple things to just let you know. We've had a pretty, pretty gruesome weather over here to start the year off with. So that's kind of hit our hit our uh, local businesses pretty hard. So if you're sticking around here for the after hour summit, go make sure you spread a little bit of money downtown here because we got some local merchants that could, could really use a hand. And if, uh, you know, if you're running low on money, we've got a uh, community bank ATM machine right downtown because <laughs> we, we, we've, been, we've been struggling as well there from that. And so a little bit of fee income wouldn't, wouldn't hurt. And I know we got some other bankers in the room. Casey, I, I, I can see you right there. Where's Blood of that? I saw him floating around here. Yeah, well, I got dibs, guys. I saw him first. Good luck. So uh, I'm here to introduce Lou Zaccarilla. He was here our, for our first, for our first uh, summit five years ago, so it's good to have him back. Um, Lou is a social entrepreneur credited with initiating the Global Intelligent Community Movement. As a founder of the Intelligent Community Forum, he developed the Forum's iconic awards program and has founded two institutes for the study of the intelligent community in North America. He speaks to audiences and community leaders worldwide to help them understand the best practices that will help make their cities and towns leading communities. He shows how broadband is the first step in the drive to enhance local business growth, social innovation, creativity, and a sense of the possible, even in places hit hard by the new economy. He appears regularly in the media and is a frequent keynote speaker and moderator at events on subjects related to small cities, tech's impact on the economy, brain gain versus brain drain, and how satellite communications produce a better world. He's often quoted in influential forums around the globe, including the Annual Wealth Report, Taiwan's Ideas Magazine, and Global Technology. He spoke at the 2012 Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo and at the TED Talks in Rio in June of 2016. Uh, Lou was born and raised in Lyons, New York, which he never refers to as the middle of nowhere. Um, I actually looked it up and you got to zoom in real far on Google Maps to find this place. We even, got, we even have a guy that went to school in Oneonta and he couldn't find it. Oh man. So, uh, he holds a master's degree from the University of Notre Dame and he lives in Manhattan. Lou, come on up. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Good introduction. Well, thank you, Tom. I, uh, I'll be sure to tell my mother who actually wrote my bio uh, that, that she's hard to find on a Google map. She's 93, so I don't, I don't know if that's going to mean that much to her. But uh, thank you for that introduction, and um, we'll, uh, we'll see what we can do to help Community Bank um, continue to grow the local economy here. At least we'll put some ideas out there. That's, that's kind of what we do. Um, before I start, though, I, I really uh, do want to thank Dave Wilson for having me back. I was here at the, at the very first one. I was honored to be the, uh, the speaker here. And uh, this is great that I come back now, um, uh, on Dave's last one, um, to, to be able to do this. So thank you for welcoming me to your home. Because um, I uh, came a, a long way, but it doesn't seem like a long way when I sit around people who really are passionate about the places they call home. I have to also say that on my first trip out here, I don't know if you still have this. These are Dave's top 10 tips to thrive and survive. Um, did anybody, did you still give these out? Yeah. yeah, Dave's top 10 strategy questions and Dave's top 10 values. And I actually carry it around with me. I've been carrying it around for five years. And um, when I was in China, I actually held it up. And a million Chinese 
threw out the little book of Mao and now are carrying this around. <laughs> so congratulations to David. Give him a hand on it. Um, one of the uh, top 10 strategy questions, number five, is uh, how do I define success? And I think, you know, the way I would define it is to look at the work that's been done here by the chamber and the community. You are a, one of the world's intelligent communities, by the way. And to say to yourselves, um, we define success by the way we think about our future. Because that's really what I want to talk to you about today, which is the, uh, the next wave in community growth. So we're so smart, now what? Is the, is the title. And, and the reason I say that is because there are a couple of things happening today in the world. First of all, I believe we're, um, we're in a new renaissance. I think for the first time in about 400 years, communities, cities, are doing the things that were done in northern Europe, in cities like Italy and so forth, way back when, which is they are gathering art, technology, business, the intellectual capital of a place, and bringing it all together in a collaborative fashion. Now, you can, you can argue that that was really the stew that created the first renaissance, which gave the West, not, not just this part of the country, I mean the West, like the big West, 400 years of technological uh, superiority. And, and it goes all the way back to those, to those moments when knowledge, if you remember um, the Benedictine monks in Monte Cassino in Italy, after the, the Dark Ages, had all the knowledge, and they had a mechanism called the university for putting it out into the villages and communities around them. And that knowledge empowered a group and a class of people to create, again, what we now know as the knowledge economy. So that was, that was by design. And I think we're going through that again because you don't have to look too far. I come from New York. Um, I'm not too far from Washington. As a matter of fact, a former New Yorker now lives in Washington. And a lot of my neighbors are happy about that, but that's their politics. Um, but wherever I go, leaders actually tell me the same thing, which is, and Henry Kissinger actually said this uh, a while back, national governments as they were, dis as they were designed are increasingly dysfunctional. I mean, they have big armies. They, they can manage their military. So they spend a lot of money on it. Um, but they also um, are unable to manage the complexity of the problems that confront us today, whether it be the environment, whether it be the new economy, the disruptive economy, which is a hard thing to get your, to get your hands around. And so what's happening is that, and, and it's not because they're bad people. I have to say, I, you know, I get a chance to meet with some senior uh, people, uh, prime ministers and so forth. but. These are men and women who are passionate, patriots. But the, the problems are just too complex. So what's happened is that the communities, the cities have become the laboratories for, for us going forward. So we're developing new models for our economy, new ways to manage our power, new ways to, to let our money flow. But it's all being done locally, but with a global possibility for those communities. And again, that's, that's something that hasn't confronted us for a long time. But I think it's very, very exciting. I think it's just a very, very exciting time to be a place like Walla Walla and to be one of my intelligent communities where this stuff goes, goes forward. As my father always said, you know, always hang around with people who are smarter than you are because you can't learn anything from stupid ones. <laughs> and uh, referring to my mother again, she said, well, great, he'll have a lot of friends. So. <laughs> I think the stakes are very, very high today. Um, this is, uh, um, I don't know if any of you like satellites. I actually started a business in the satellite industry many years ago. I love satellites. I think they're real cool. But uh, three satellites, by the way, in geosynchronous orbit can cover the entire Earth with a broadband footprint. So we connect everybody, right? But if you do a flyby over the Korean Peninsula tonight, and I just use Korea as an example because this is a very stark contrast. You will see you know, exactly what, what is up there on the screen. Um, well, you won't see the words North Korea and South Korea. <laughs> Actually, I just put that up there for American university students who thought that was Florida. <laughs> so, that's true. Um, 
We have an educational issue. What can I say? But you don't hear. You have a great community college. Um, what do you actually see, though? Right? What's the first thing that hits your eye? Right, the light. Right, South Korea at night is is lit up. Right, it's a it's a great analogy for fiber optics. Right, because they call fiber the light. But what's really going on there is that the the great the great cities uh, of South Korea, as with the great cities in America and Europe and other parts of the world, the free societies are mobilizing their communities. And you see, uh, well, you see Suwon, where Samsung is headquartered. You can see um, Seoul, the Gangnam district, and so forth. And they're just thriving. They've embraced the ideas that broadband is the new railroad and that they can link their economy to it. And that technology will inform every other part of their businesses, whether they're local, and there are in, you know, 1,500 local businesses in Suwon that revolve around the Samsung company, or Samsung itself, I think $90 billion company. So they've, they've harnessed this, and they're now connecting it to their human intelligence. Right? Like Taiwan, Korea is the, one of the most educated populations on Earth. They don't have any oil. They don't have any things that they can extract from the Earth, but they can extract human knowledge, human intelligence. And so they're lit up. They're, they're going forward. Um, it was kind of interesting, actually, when I first visited uh, Korea. First place they took me was to an archery. This is instructive. They, they took me to an archery range, right? You know, and um, so I get out there, and you know, it's like little kids, you know, business people, senior citizens. They're all practicing archery, and I'm telling you, they were hitting the bullseye more times than they weren't. It was amazing. Actually, and you know, so you know, I'm I'm the, the the guest, right? The VIP, whatever. So they asked me to do it, and I actually, what do I? New York, right? Like we go hunting with bow and arrows, you know. <laughs> but so I, I, you know, I tried this out, and first arrow just sort of went like off into the crowd. You know, I scattered about 50 people, but uh, so I stopped. But afterwards, I asked. I said, "Why did you take me here? You know, you're a high-tech economy. I'm, I'm here to, you know, look at your intelligent community programs and so forth. How you use your broadband." And they said, "Well, Mr. Zachary, we wanted to show you something. We wanted to let you know that Koreans have historically been very good at precision, at fine things. And now we're just importing that to the 21st century, and we're making what, you know, fine things, small things, electronics." This is what we're good at. And so my, what I took away from that, the poetry of that for me was that you don't have to be somebody else. You know, if you, if you live in a small community and you're defined by something for 150, 200 years, you can use the tools that are out there today to continue to leverage that and to grow your local economies. But you do have to do a few things that most communities haven't taken the time to think about or to do. And I'll tell you what those are later. But that's really what goes on when you hear about these, these great economies. They're built on great cities. Taiwan's the same, same thing. Um, one of, when we started thinking about how to make cities better, uh, we mobilized uh, a lot of big thinkers, the guys who founded the BlackBerry. They were friends of ours. And they were just they were eliminating distance, right? The uh, mayor of Taipei at the time was a friend of ours. And his idea, he became the president, actually, Mr. Ma. And his idea was to take the intelligent community concept and to have every one of his cities in Taiwan become intelligent communities because that would lead to an intelligent nation. And so the, the entire nation of Taiwan would function like a Renaissance city. And you can see what happens over there. You've got 23 million people pointed toward you know, a big monster across the China Sea of 1.3 billion. And they punch way above their weight economically. And they're starting to go out in Southeast Asia and places like Vietnam and some of these other countries with their technology, what, what they have learned. And they are continuing to thrive economically. So the stakes are very high. If you get it right, you know, it, you get the rewards. But go a little bit north of the 38th parallel, and what do you see? Right, absolute darkness. So you can see a place that has decided not to go toward the 21st century, but rather toward the 12th century. And you can see the consequences. So then that would be North Korea. Um, actually, people always ask me, um, what's this little dot of light here? And I always say, well, you know, it's a, it's a Mariners fan looking for the World Series. <laughs> you know, Dave, I didn't know if that joke would go over here. But I, I think they're being polite. Yeah. 
Um, but, I, but I use this analogy for a purpose. This is what's going on in cities. Okay, this is what's going on for your city, for your port, for your leading thinkers here, for, for Dave and his team at the chamber. The stakes are very high. You have to think about getting this right because what you're laying down now with your telecommunications infrastructure, with your educational infrastructure, which is being radically revamped, is the, is the economy for two or three generations out. And you have those conditions, those opportunities haven't existed probably since the end of the Second World War, where a generation of leaders like yourselves can go out and shape the future for kids who hopefully will stay here and not leave, because that's one of the biggest problems we see today in smaller communities, who will stay here and two or three generations down the road when there's an even more prosperous Walla Walla with 350 wineries, right, and, and maybe some tech companies, will say, that generation got it right. They move toward the light. And for us, that's, that's the holy grail. That's what we try to get out of intelligent communities. Now, we're a think tank, as, uh, as Tom said when he introduced me. Um, we study about 159 communities now around the world that have been designated as intelligent, including yours. Um, and we look at this in a, in a very, very you know, rigorous uh, academic way. We have two institutes. We have one in uh, the state of Ohio, which I'll tell you a little bit about. We have one at Mississippi State University, which is actually studying rural issues. We're putting broadband into some of the more uh, poor and small communities in Mississippi. And we're seeing if broadband can actually activate those economies, because those places are really getting, getting wiped out. Um, we have an ICF Canada organization where 31 cities and towns in Canada work together, their local businesses on uh, issues that are relevant to Canada, but it also positions them to go out into the world, small business, but as Canada, to do trade as intelligent communities. And it gives them an advantage with site selectors, a foreign direct investment, and so forth. Because, you know, all things considered, if you're going to invest your money, Tom, where would you rather put it? In an intelligent community or one that ain't so bright? So that's, you know, that's the proposition. We also have one in Taiwan. We have an ICF Taiwan organization, which I uh, was pleased to launch uh, last year, where we have 13 cities now uh, who are doing the same thing. They are organizing their techno technology companies, trying to grow their small businesses to continue to keep Taiwan as an active uh, economic tiger. But at the end of the day, all this stuff, this technology stuff, it, it is not what this is about. It's not why I did it. Actually, I did it because Lyons, New York, was one of those communities where the young people left. You know, had terrific industries, uh, you know, good farms, um, had a lot going for it. But the railroad went away. The railroad was the, was the primary driver for my grandfather and immigrants like that who came in. Within a generation and a half, that had, that had just been, become irrelevant as, a, as an economic generator or even an enabler. And nobody was figuring out the next generation of infrastructure for it. And it just pained me. And so I have spent a lot of time and money trying to find out what happened to that place and to uh, understand how it can be that it doesn't happen uh, anywhere else. And I think we've made some pretty good progress. Uh, we were invited to speak at the Nobel Prize in 2012 on how intelligent communities can enable a more free and open economy and society. So, so the, the issue is global. You know, If you get into this, you're, not, you're certainly not alone. People have been talking about this for a long, long time. But the basic proposition is very simple. There's no place like home. It's the one thing nobody in this room could disagree with. Right? I mean, you can disagree about you know, what's the best wine, uh, what's the best food, you know, whether Dave Wilson really is the most uh, interesting man in America. <laughs> He's certainly in the top five. But there's no place like home. And so we tried to build a movement off that, because everybody has an interest there. And everybody will go to work to make sure that their homes, not their countries. You know, you'll fight for your country for about four or five years, but if things start going south, I'm not so sure you're going to keep fighting for something as abstract as nation. But home, you all know what that is. And you'll keep going. And you'll keep working it. And that's what we found. And that's what's reactivating places like Sunderland, England, where we went from 28% unemployment to four, using some of the principles that I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes. OK. Now, the middle of nowhere is no more. Who the heck said that? Um, well, here's a statistic. In 2013, 35% of the top 100 fastest growing companies in the world 
were located outside of major metro areas. So what's, what that is telling you is that distance is far less relevant. And again, people have been saying this for years. You know, Tom Friedman famously, the world is flat, and, and dozens of other people. You know, the late uh, Professor Barber, Ben Barmer, Barber, just uh, just passed away. These guys have all been telling you uh, that you know, again, distance doesn't matter, but you've got to get again the new railroad running so that it runs a lot faster. I think again, this is a great opportunity for for the local businesses and the local communities like Walla Walla. So if the middle is nowhere is no, no more, um, you know, it's not because of word of mouth. <laughs> and, and by the way, on a Walla Walla summer, would you buy a clam for the, from this guy without any ice and everything out there? But, uh, but the middle of nowhere is no more because of fiber and because of other types of connectivity, satellites, right? So what that means and the, the conditions that are very exciting with regard to that are that for the first time in human history, so far as we know, two conditions exist that never existed before. First one is a human being can live anywhere he or she wants. The second one is they can be connected to a global economy. Right? So that means that you can have a local business here. Obviously, you can do business locally. You can do business regionally, as you do. But if you can apply enough innovation to it, you can export that business. That business can scale in places like Vietnam, like Brazil, parts of the world that, again, are consuming these things. And again, that's how we're scaling local businesses. That's how we're seeing, getting, seeing them get scaled across the world. But the thing that connects these two unique historical elements or events is the connecting point. And that's why when we talk about broadband, uh, we say that it is the new railroad. It is very, very important to have that new railroad in place. Now I say new railroad, what does that mean? Well, do you put in tracks? Do you put in locomotives? Do you put in cabooses? Or caboose? I don't know, what's the plural for caboose? Goodbye, maybe. Um, anyway, they don't even have cabooses anymore. That's how sophisticated it's become. But you need that new railroad because the, the railroad, because the proposition's the same. If you think of the old railroad, uh, if you lived along the line, as my hometown Lions did, you could do some amazing things. In the 1840s, my, that little town where I grew up exported 85% of the world's peppermint and peppermint oil extraction products across the United States. It dominated. It was the Microsoft of peppermint. <laughs> True. Um, you need that railroad because if it runs through your town, you put stuff on it, whether it's peppermint or coal or timber, the old, you know, the commodities from, from the industrial economy, you put them out there and you trade. You trade with Oregon, you trade with Utah, you trade with Western Canada, whatever. The new railroad, same thing, except the cargo is weightless. Right? The cargo is what you dream up. It's your small business ideas, your, your, your companies, basically, are, are ideas. And you export them now. It's weightless cargo. And as I say, you don't just take it to the next uh, spatially economic place. You take it around the world to the, to the digital space. And again, I, I don't think this is new information to anybody, but we are really seeing it uh, flourish now um, around the world and under the guise of the intelligent community. But again, I say it's not about technology. Technology is not the thing. We, it takes a smart city to become an intelligent community. And what does that mean? Well, I'll try to define it simply. We've made a few mistakes today um, thinking that technology will solve all of our problems. In, in communities. Well, they won't. Uh, it won't. It's, it's just a tool. You know, it's not any different than at the dawn of the Iron Age, people were using iron to, to mobilize that economy, right? But technology is a, is a terrific enabler. But it is, it is not the center of an intelligent community, okay? The technology is just, as I say, the, the tool, the railroad that gets you there. So at the heart of, an, of a smart city, and you hear a lot about smart cities, you hear people say, oh, we're smart cities. At the heart of a smart city, though, is, is a device. It's a machine, right? And you don't want the soul of your city being a device or a machine. At the heart of the intelligent community is human joy. And that's a big difference. And that's what I think places like this, and this is one of the reasons I come back, have to offer. This is a place where people really enjoy living, where the quality of life is really good, and where a sense of happiness prevails.
Now we know that if you take those conditions and you hook it up to the intelligent community notion that you get a much better economic expression, as the economists say. And we've had several uh, Nobel Prize winning economists who have connected joy, quality of life, the way a lot of you live your life, to economic output, right? Because that's what's at the heart of the intelligent community and creativity is the heart of the new economy. So, you know, Al Gore says that um, human intelligence is the only endless natural resource. I say true, but we're not very good at extracting it. You know, I was just, I was just up, and I'm not saying people are stupid. Um, well, some of the guys I grew up with were stupid, actually, now that I think about it. But when I was up in Canada, up in Edmonton just now, they're a terrific community. They've been very, very good at extracting oil, right? But now they're starting to move in another direction, right? They're starting to, to they've got a, a very young mayor up there, a 36-year-old guy who really gets this. And he says, we've got all kinds of experience and intelligence. We're going to mine that like, we, like we've extracted oil. And if you mobilize your educational systems and your community around intelligence and take that plunge, and it's a little dicey because it's, it's nonlinear. It's not like building an auto manufacturing plant, you know, like, like in the, uh, the post-industrial economy. But if you let that creativity loose, you know, like they do in Redmond and places like that, then local economies really start to boom. But again, there's a discipline that, that is required and a certain risk that is always taken before that happens. But the first thing you have to do is understand how important your broadband and your digital networks are. Because if you don't have that railroad, you ain't going to get that peppermint anywhere. Okay? So intelligent communities are ones that have joy, that have human expression, that have human uh, potential being realized uh, at their core. Now, in order to become an intelligent community, there are six things that you need to do, OK? And if, you know, again, Walla Walla wants to continue to go down this path and become uh, not just uh, smart but uh, fully intelligent, here's what others have done. And we've been studying this since 2001. You have to have your broadband right. Um, you know, we talked about that. You have to have your knowledge workforce right. And I'll, I'll, I'll simplify all of these, but there's a lot more detail uh, on our website. The knowledge workforce is very simple. Can you assure the next generation that they have a pathway to the middle class? Because that pathway is going to depend on the way they use knowledge for the way they make a living. And I, and I don't care if they're you know, using machines to, to get grapes off the vines or using sensors, uh, whatever it is. And knowledge is going to be used in every endeavor that leads to the middle class. So again, you have to uh, begin to accept that and look at your workforce and see whether it is aligned to push people into the middle class. Maybe not this generation, but the next one. Uh, innovation, uh, you know, again, we know, we know how important innovation is. Uh, innovation, as Steve Jobs said, is just connecting the dots. You know, it's, it's creativity. So IBM does a study of 1,500 CEOs, and they find out that the one core competence that those, uh, all those companies are looking for is creativity in their senior managers. Those are, that means they're looking for innovators, essentially. Digital equality, are you using your libraries? Are you using your society to bring everybody along? Is the library a place where the new railroad gets built for people who may not have the access or can afford the digital tools at home? Because the beautiful thing about this is that you know, some young kid in the Philippines today, you know, picking through a, a, a big stack of garbage, you put him in front of a computer as Sunit Singh and the Data Wind Corporation has been doing for many, many years in places like India, you put him in front of a computer, you give him digital literacy, and in about six months, he's going to be doing more stuff on that device than you and I are. And he's economic potential. He's that potential waiting to be extracted, waiting, waiting to be mined. Are there people like that in your community that are sitting dormant? Um, you have to activate them. Sustainability, that's, you know, that's an obvious one. You know, um, when I was in China, they're racing ahead in terms of cleaning up their environment. And I asked one of the leaders why, you know? And he said, well, Mr. Zaccarello, Chinese like money more than anything else. And he said, so far as you have to breathe to make money, we're going to clean up the environment. <laughs> it's a good rationale. Makes sense, right? And then there's also, you know, uh, the sustainability that I talked about earlier, where you're ensuring that your systems are in place to allow two or three generations to prosper and to build big statues to you for getting it right. Now, the final one that we look for in our communities is advocacy. Advocacy is how well do you tell your story? Now, 
we're tribal beings. Human beings are just tribes, right? This is the Walla Walla tribe, right? Um, I don't know if you guys pound drums or what. I think you just tip wine. That's your tribal ritual. It's my, one of my favorite, by the way. That's why we're here. Um, but we thrive and we go forward based on the stories we tell each other, right? Advocate. So the chiefs of the tribe tell the rest of the tribe, this is where we want to go. This is how we get there. This is our future. This, this is what the tribal council is thinking about doing and continuously reinforcing that. And that new narrative begins to take hold. In Waterloo, Ontario, where they produce 10% of all the publicly traded companies in Canada, a community of 115,000 people, the mayor of the city, when she was in office, used to, first day of school, go to the library and gather the pe young people around and tell them stories about how they were the intelligent community of the year in 2007. She said, we're the home of Blackberry. We're the home of Semantic. We are in an intelligent community. That's what our tribal ethos is. And today, if you go up there, uh, you'll find that they are beginning to work in quantum mechanics, quantum computing, and are working to replace silicon as the next big thing for their economy. So that's the kind of advocacy, again, that is taking place in some of the communities that I visit and observe. And then there's the advocacy of just telling your story uh, to the rest of the world. And, you know, I, Walla Walla is doing pretty good there. Uh, you know, somebody asked me, do people in New York know about Walla Walla? Yeah, they do. They know about the wine country. Um, you know, they, they read the Wine Spectator, um, and they, they saw uh, Mr. Barron on the cover. You know, that was, uh, that's advocacy. That, that's telling your story. So those are the six indicators that we use. And again, I, I would challenge you to think about Walla Walla today and to see how you're performing against those six criteria. And to remember that broadband is really the, the igniter of all of those. Um, what you really do want to create is an environment, right? Um, the great advancements are made not by individuals, but by environments. You want a place where you're continuously producing innovations, where your small businesses, you know, are getting together constantly and saying, you know, it's like, it's like a jazz session. That's why I put Louis Armstrong up there. What, what can we come up with collectively to do something else, you know, and even take it global, take a more global platform? Um, we've, in our in our work, we've got a foundation of 159 cities. Two of them, Waterloo, which I just mentioned, and, and Eindhoven in Holland. They are now embedding small business people, academics, and some city uh, economic development folks in each other's cities and working in specific areas of nanotechnology where both of them have a competence, but where they also have a need in that area. And so the goal for them is to activate more new businesses around nanotech create new industries that have never existed before, to create new environments where, again, these technologies that R&D can work together in a pool and thrive. Uh, the Dutch call it the triple helix, which is the local government, the academic research sector, and the private sector, the, the, the banks, the business people, are, are working together on a constant basis. A tribal council that comes together regularly has very specific goals and creates a new DNA, that's why they call it the helix, for that place. And I'll tell you, if you go to Eindhoven, Holland, where Philips used to have its manufacturing, and you, and you just start sniffing around there, you'll see innovation after innovation in areas like lighting and, and nanotechnology and automotive uh, uh, work. They actually outproduce China in terms of smart automobiles. They know that's where the money's going to be. But they've worked very hard to create that environment for it. So it's not a coincidence that these great innovations tend to come out of, you know, 18 or 19 places in the world. And that's, uh, you know, economically, that's been the trend. Winston Churchill actually coined that phrase, empires of the mind. If any of you are uh, history buffs, I saw a picture of Eisenhower in the, in the Whitman Hotel. That's that, that same era. But in 1943, middle of World War II, England was not doing all that great yet. Um, Churchill makes a speech, and he says that the next empires, he's talking from the podium of the British Empire. He says, the next empires will be the empires of the mind. And I think he previsioned the weightless cargo, the new railroad. So everything is illuminated. That picture at the bottom is Mike Lazaridis, my friend who is one of the founders of the Research in Motion, the BlackBerry. He actually holds the, the patent on the smartphone. He owns that. He developed that technology. That building uh, to the right is the Perimeter Institute. What Mike did, he's put up $250 million, I think, of his own money. He's got provincial money to match it. 
and they have brought in 50 of the world's leading quantum physicists to just do pure quantum uh, physics uh, calculations and work. Um, and it's an, it's an amazing place. Um, they have walls where you, know, you walk down the halls and there's, there's formulas on these whiteboards. And, and you know, they asked me to write something there and I, I said, you know, cheese on my pizza. I didn't know what to write. <laughs> But it's an amazing place, and what's happening is that the theoretical work that's being done there is now exporting itself across the street to the University of Waterloo, where there's a quantum computing department. And now that stuff is going to get commercialized. So again, that's the kind of environment that's uh, taking place. And the small businesses there that serve this are beginning to link themselves up to it. So they're growing their opportunities off this, this rich ecosystem. Um, OK, here are the new empires of the world. I think it's, as I said, I think it's going to be cities. Um, you know, uh, Professor Ben Barber, I don't know if any of you are familiar with his work. He just passed away. He's a great guy. He's about 76. He wrote a book with, I think, the, the best title I've ever seen, If Mayors Rule the World. Right? Um, these are the new empires of the world with mayors and no Caesar. Um, Dublin, Ohio. Anybody know where Dublin is? It's on the uh, sort of the cusp, the, the border of Columbus, 42,000 people. Most people know it because of the Jack Nicholas golf tournament. Nicholas built the course there. They do the memorial tournament there. It brings them visibility. It also brought them a lot of technology. The networks had to come in and, and wire the place. And so um, one of the things that got done as a result of that was that the city manager um, said, hey, you know, we've got, we got this need for all this fiber. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we build ourselves a municipal fiber network and tie it to our economic development program? Okay, and we're, we'll build a community accelerator and we'll connect our hospitals with the municipal fiber. We won't compete. We won't compete with the incumbents, you know, because legally that was a dicey thing to do. But we'll connect all these other places, the libraries, the schools, the hospitals, and um, we'll create new businesses, new small businesses. So in a place of 42,000 people, the average size of the small business is seven. But there's also large businesses now connected. Wendy's is out there, um, the limited. Dublin, Ohio, thanks to what they've done with fiber, and today it's a 100 megabit monster fiber network connected to all the research platforms throughout the state of Ohio, has produced more Fortune 1000 companies than any other city in the United States on a per capita basis. So again, you know, I'm a, I'm a guy who stands five foot six, and I'm here to tell you, size doesn't matter. I said that a long time ago for other reasons. but. Uh, it really doesn't. It's, it's about intelligence. It's about what they connected, what they were able to do there. So, and they continue to do it, and now they're taking the lead in automotive uh, autonomous vehicle research. They've, they've built along the 33 quarter. They've gotten millions of dollars of grants from the U.S. government. But that fiber network started it all, okay? And, you know, they're going to start owning the automotive space because all the OEMs were historically out in Ohio anyway. So when President Trump tells you that, you know, um, you know, manufacturing is dead, or the, the way to bring it back is to, you know, uh, scare some company into coming back from uh, Mexico. Maybe, I don't know. I'm not a politician, but I, I can tell you that this is all homegrown. This is done with people sitting around in their cities, in their businesses, and saying, what can we do with this, this technology stuff? Now, as a result, what's happening in, in uh, Dublin, Ohio, where we have an institute, is that Dublin is the hub for an intelligent Ohio project, where all of the cities and communities in, in Ohio are going to look a lot like those in Taiwan. They actually got the idea from Taiwan. And so what you're going to see in what, you know, again, was derisively referred to as the Rust Belt is a true renaissance. And it's, and it's already happening. I mean, if anybody's been to Columbus, you should, it's just booming. Dublin, I mean, you know, they actually have trouble finding the people on the other side of the digital divide. So this stuff does work. We've seen it work. Uh, Gray County in Ontario, uh, where cows and robots intermarry. And I'm, uh, I'm not going to touch that, but that's, that's a, a straight line for Dave. Um, you know, I saw 600 cows getting milked by robots. And, and, and the whole process was being managed by two PhDs from India. It's a very sophisticated process. They had a revolving stall, 50 cows at a time. They, they do four milkings a day. They've got that farm so sophisticated that there are no, honestly, there are no flies in the barn. I mean, I, saw, I was looking for flies, right? I, I walked through that barn. I, I could not find a fly. 
And so what that did, because they were able to, to manage that, is it allowed them to cut the tails of the cows a little bit so that it wouldn't interfere with the milking. So all these efficiencies got introduced into this local business, which exports its cream and its milk to very high standards. Canadians have much higher standards than we do for our milk you know, uh, all across North America. But again, that was leveraged by, by technology. Remember, I, I told you, technology is not the thing. In this case, milk is the thing. You know, it's, it's got milk, but technology enabled it. So that's when we talk about digital infrastructure, that's the kind of stuff that, that is the, uh, the outcome of it. And this is a, a terrific farm. Uh, Mitchell, South Dakota, 16,000 people. They lost 30% of their population in the 1950s, 60s, early 70s. The 30% of the kids, everybody, they, just, they were just walking out of that place, leaving, their, leaving the bisons there on the plain. I think they elected a bison mayor one year because they couldn't find anybody to run for the, for the council. But they ended up putting three broadband carriers into the city. One was done through a university, which uh, actually teaches satellite. So they had this need. They figured out how to, how to scale it, brought three other ones in, drove down the costs of telecom, created from their small local telecom consulting businesses, two big global companies, and now are headfirst into smart farming. Their corn yield is, has grown larger than any other place in the United States. I've driven a smart tractor. You don't drive it. It drives you. And again, you, you, know, you may know this better than me, but you know, it, it plants seeds in different parts of the field that have been mapped by GIS. It manages water supply, which is a big issue here. And, and it's able to do all that. Their unemployment rate today is 2.6%. Everybody's come back. Young people have come back. I have a colleague from Notre Dame now who grew up out there. She's back. She's working for the city in their youth employment area. So again, another seemingly a miracle, right? But people were taking those six principles of the intelligent community and moving forward. Stockholm, Sweden, you all know where Stockholm is, right? Um, they built an open access network many years ago. The city said, we're going to dig, the, we're going to dig just once. And we're going to create, we're going to overlay it with as much dark fiber as we can. And we'll let any uh, ISP, any carrier, any company with a, a fiber need to come in and connect to it. Now, what that's done, and the reason they did it, was it's created 115 telecommunications providers in Stockholm. So when you look every year at the Economist's uh, report of the most competitive economies on Earth, Sweden's always in the top five. And when I asked them why, they said because we were able to drive our telecom costs down in our, in our capital city where you know, Ericsson and 2,000 other tech companies are located. And they said that, that competitiveness in telecom allowed businesses from all across the EU and the world to come here to invest. Businesses, I mean, I don't need to tell you guys this, like low costs of doing business. And boy, I'll tell you, Sweden is a great place to live. Stockholm's a great city. Um, it gets a little cold in the winter. But uh, it's a terrific place. So again, what are the results of that? Again, it's not the technology. Now, Stockholm is home to five of Europe's 10 fastest growing companies. So half the fastest growing companies in Europe are now in Stockholm, this, this socialist paradise, as they used to call it. Not so. Go there. It's a thriving entrepreneurial center. The Schista Science City has over 2,500 companies, small businesses, who started as small Swedish businesses and now are, again, exporting throughout the EU, into Asia, and so forth. And again, this is not an accident. This is that environment that I talked about. But a lot of the processes were nonlinear. You know, they, they threw accelerators in there, incubators. You know, they were, they were experimenting. And you do have to experiment with your local economy to get it to grow. Uh, finally, this, I think, is probably a pretty good match for Walla Walla Stratford. Um, Stratford is, of course, famously the home of the uh, North American Shakespeare Festival, but also of, of course, Justin Bieber. Um, Justin Bieber's from there. Um, this is a place where they actually held on to their uh, power utility. It was community owned when everybody else was selling it off to the provinces. Uh, they actually kept theirs. And because of the rights away that they, the city itself had access to, they um, built a fiber network, their own city fiber network around it. And so a lot of virtuous things happened once they did that. Um, uh, among the two, two that I really liked, and again, this is something to think about, 42,000 people, 32,000 actually, they said, we're a great place to be a beta test site in real time for any company that wants to come in and test. So uh, 
Toshiba came in and tested their new uh, LED street lighting system for communities, you know, the lights that have the CPU units in them where you can collect data around the clock on your city and show what time you need to lower the lights, what time you need to raise them, um, that kind of stuff. They said, yeah, you know what, Toshiba, come in here. We'll give you, the, we'll give you a, as much of the city as you want. We're not going to pay for this lighting stuff. You put it in. Hey, if it works out for you, you only have to do one thing for us. You have to locate here. You have to locate your North American office right here. Right? Banks loved it. Royal Bank of Canada was all over it. Right? They came there, and, and it worked. And as a result, a lot of small lighting companies uh, from Silicon Valley and places have, have come there because it's, it's an experimental ground. Didn't really cost the mayor very much. You know, he had to run water out there and conduit and stuff like that. Had, you know, the cops had to go out there and patrol. But generally speaking, people who are working 18 hours a day in R&D aren't out uh, you know, committing crimes, you know, uh, stealing popsicles from uh, stores. So that was a good bet for them. The other thing, with that, all that fiber, they were able to attract the Royal Bank of Canada's major data center. Um, and, and, and then a lot of others because they had this capacity. Now about 30% of the Canadian economy actually flows through Stratford, through these, these massive data centers that they had there. Data centers in and of themselves aren't necessarily that great a bet in terms of employment. You know, they'll employ maybe I don't know, 60, 70 people. But the cachet and the, the added value of having those networks there can do a lot of virtuous things. A lot of the virtuous things you do with data is, is open access data, right? I don't know what the, if there's an open access data policy here in the city. But what we find is that when cities do that, when they give the information that, the, that is the people's back to the people, young people write applications around it and start businesses off things like, you know, we've identified, I just was in um, Edmonton, where they, I, they were allowed to identify all of the cultural assets in the city, all of them, and put them in one place and create a business and a platform around it, a tour business, an historic research business, because they were able to get this data from the city and find places that didn't even exist and put them in a package of you know, the arts of Edmonton. So again, this is not, this is not real high-level stuff. This is not creating you know, the next Microsoft, but it's creating the next local business that's gone from 50 people to 500 people. And that's kind of what you're looking for, I think, um, in most parts of the world. So these are my new empires of the world, and there are, as I say, hundreds of them out there. OK, I don't know if any of this stuff scares you, because it's like, wow, the futures. I don't know how we're going to get there. I don't know how we're going to be this city. But it really is a, it's more a question of how you think more than anything else. And uh, I, I'll put a food example up there. Does anybody know who uh, Massimi, Massimo Botara is? Any, any hands? There's two people who really like. You like to eat here, I know, but uh, yeah, he's a he's a great Italian chef. The way he got to be a great Italian chef was this. Is, this is a true story, and, but it it talks to innovation. So he's uh, in a, in a restaurant in Italy. He's, his sous chef, uh, his pastry chef, is a uh, Japanese guy, and they're making um, lemon tarts. Very expensive dish in that restaurant, and. You know, they're, they're get, trying to get a rush order out. Some big shots were out there. They only got two left. They, the, the order was for two. They, they literally had two left. And the, uh, the Japanese uh, chef brings out the, the first lemon tart. He's putting it, he's, it's a plate, it's a little cold. He's putting it up uh, on, the, on the table. The thing, this thing slides out and just breaks. Ends up looking like that, right? And according, to, there's a great video of this on YouTube. I, I usually show it, but Butara, you know, typical Italian, right? They, they don't, we're, we're kind of unflappable because we're nuts. Uh, but we're also very creative. He, uh, he just kind of looks, looks at it. And the, the Japanese chef, according to the story, does what a, what a good Japanese will do. He offered to kill himself. <laughs> but the chef said, no, no, that's not necessary. It's a lemon tart. Um, but he looked at it and he, he dressed it up. You know, he, he went to work on it and he made it look beautiful on that plate. And he called it the deconstructed lemon tart. And then he said to the chef, now break the other one. And the chef's, you know, he's still freaking out, right? He's, he's still considering harikari. Broke the other one, put it on the plate, brought it out, true story, served it. The guy's career took off. It became his signature dish. He now, again, you can't get into his restaurants if you go to Italy. Um, 
<laughs> the point of that story is not to get you hungry for lemon tarts. It's to show you that innovation really is about an unexpected moment that can be taken advantage of to create something great. And that's been the nature of creativity since the time of the Renaissance and well, well before. But how do we get that deeper and deeper into our thinking, into our local economies, into our local businesses? So I like to use that example. Now I'm getting hungry, David. OK, uh, we're going to wrap it up here. But I think the great challenge, in addition to deciding whether you want to go from the light to the dark, is to understand that the chief object of education, as G.K. Chesterton said about 120 years ago, is not to learn things, but to unlearn them. You know, getting yourself away from sort of the bad habits that you get into in terms of thinking about your businesses, thinking about your local economy, because things have changed. I mean, we can't, we can't deny it. And we do know that anybody who studies Buddhism, as they told me, uh, knows that the first noble truth of Buddhism is that we suffer. It's, uh, it's just the way it is. But the second noble truth that Buddha discovered was that the reason we suffer is because we're attached. We cling to things that, by their very nature, are always in movement. And that would be your economy. That would be your community. That would be your life. And so if you can codify that notion and accept it and understand that a jet airplane has no reverse gear, the Walla Walla is going to go forward one way or the other, then I think it's a little easier to, to unlearn. But you have to convene on it. You have to dedicate yourself to following the path toward becoming an intelligent community, which David put you on five years ago when I stood here and talked about this. And I think you've done a hell of a job. Uh, if I didn't, you know, obviously I wouldn't be here. Um, every year, we name 21 of the world's smartest communities. We, we start with about 400. They submit nominations to us. There's no cost to it. We end up with seven. Uh, we have analysts from around the world who look at the data. We name 21. Uh, we now are at the stage where we've named seven. And, and these, are not, these are not places that are really you know, marquee names, but they're doing all the things I just talked about. These seven are actually invited to New York uh, in June. They'll be there the 6th through the 8th for a, a small summit that we have. And we actually just pick their brains. We ask them in great detail how they got to where they are. And uh, we call it the Intelligent Community Forum Summit, obviously. And it's really just sort of the growth of what we did at the early days, which was to sit around with some really smart people and try to figure out what happened to my hometown. Um, fortunately, you know, what we found um, is something that has been helpful uh, throughout the world, and we're very pleased about that. So I welcome any of you who want a trip to New York. Um, you know, bring your Walla Walla wine there. Um, it's coming up uh, in a couple of weeks. If you do want to come see David, we'll issue a discount code uh, to Walla Walla. And you can spend uh, three or four days in, in the second greatest place on earth after Walla Walla. So that's my story. And um, the only thing I can say is that keep thinking that there's no place like home. Understand that the middle of nowhere is no more. And that, as Ronald Reagan said in 1983 at Moscow University, the era of brawn over brain is over. This is where we do the brain gain. And this is where we will move toward the light. So with that, I'm looking forward to uh, food and beverage and the rest of the conference. And uh, bless you all, and I, I wish you luck. So uh, we'll have, I guess, a question and answer now. So thank you. If we have time. Yeah. Um, our struggle always, there's always more stuff than there is time. But um, we, uh, we're going to take a break. But I just want to offer, if anyone has uh, a burning question or two, Lou will be here through the day. But anyone have uh, a question um, for Lou or the topic? So the one thing that uh, I, I will say is that, so when Lou and I first hooked up, when you say that Walla Walla is an intelligent community, we went through the very formal process, and it was very rigorous, um, five years ago. And uh, we, uh, it was a great exercise. And one of the things they focused on first, because uh, uh, I tend to get ahead of myself, for those of you that know, and we really had to back up and really look at what is our current set of infrastructure so that we are not selling something we can't deliver. 
Um, I, there is an initiative that is pursuing, for example, there's a great connection with the Seattle game community in Walla Walla, oddly enough. Well, can we use that as a catalyst for more? But anyway, a lose uh, and an ICF process was uh, very good. And uh, so Lou invited me, uh, I'll tell you one quick story. So he invited me to speak at their global summit in June, which I did, and just kind of take folks through some of our thinking, what we've done. And so we're, we're in the middle of uh, Brooklyn, I think, or we're yeah. in Manhattan, I forget where we were. And uh, I said, I'm sure this is an obvious question. Go ahead and raise your hands. How many of you have been to Walla Walla? You know, and these are folks from Europe and Asia and Latin America, whatever. And this one guy uh, raises his hand and he goes, uh, I was there last week, mate. And it's this Aussie and he was in Walla Walla, Australia, you know, <laughs> which, which was great. So it turned, it turned out we had nothing, nothing like drinking a few beers with an Aussie at the end of the day. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, we, we just uh, give a big round of applause, Lou Zaccarella, great friend of mine. Thanks, Dave. Is that okay? Yeah, that's good. Yeah.